giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. Oh, uh, here, here we are. It's, it's time. Um, the, the main topic today is the announcement uh, made by First that there's going to be uh, no more bag days come the 2020 season. Um, from the FRC blog, Frank states that starting in 2020, Stop Build Day will be retired. So this is a big change. That means teams will not be responsible or required to stop working on their robots on a specific day. You can just keep going. Um, Frank stated that this is part of their commitment to making the program more accessible and flexible for all participants. Let's remember these words as we have our discussion here. He also notes that approximately half of all teams choose to build a second robot, um, which that we can talk about that data point as well, and that under-resourced teams are going to have a lower barrier to success. To quote Frank, and I think this is the home run quote, and maybe it's not even necessarily fully to do 100% with the bag day, but more of the philosophies of FRC and everything that they're doing in terms of game design. We are stri striving to provide equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. So that's a philosophical statement from FRC, and I think that's very, very important. Um, our three guests today have a lot of varying opinions on this announcement, and uh, as do Libby and I as hosts. Uh, Michael uh, opposes the ending of Stop Bill Day. Jim is in favor of stop, uh, ending Stop Bill Day, as seen by his uh, terrific white paper that was published. Jim, how long ago was that white paper published? About two years. Okay, about two years, and Jim's been talking about this for a long time. And Ben's kind of on the fence. So, Ben, with you being on the fence, let's start with you and let us know your thoughts, and then we'll go from Michael to Jim to explain their opinions. We'll try and have some back-and-forth discussion, and then... If you have questions from chat, um, please post them away. Tag at first day updates now. We're going to try and get to them. Also, comments in chat because you know we want to hear what you have to think as well. One really interesting thing I want to bring up is uh, Fun ran a poll on their website, and there was over 800 voters, and the results were 49% favor the change, 51% were against the change. Uh, if you look at Chief Delphi, where there was a poll with I think it was about like 300 voters, 76% were for the change and 24 percent were against so uh there's varying opinions within different subsets of our community um the fun facebook page represents a more kind of um pop in frc fan while chief delphi as we know is full of hardcore people and trolls so there's a, a lot going on here um after after we do all this we're going to start a giveaway for the evening so don't forget about that but right now ben uh let's take the floor tell us what you think all right. Um, I'll start with uh, selfishly from a two two five perspective. Um, it doesn't really from for a, a team like us. It doesn't really change how much we're meeting. It changed what we're meeting on for sure. One of the nice things that the bag really did was it kept us off the copy train a lot. Um, where I, I can't tell you how many times after uh, you know the week ones or twos come out. And then you see 1678 and 2056 and you say like, man, you know, that's so easy. Why couldn't we just do that? Build it in our 30 pounds, put it together, um, you know, bring it in, ma make the modifications, update the robot. And every deer, it's always like, man, this is just too hard with all the bag stuff that we have to do. So it keeps you, it, it, it kept us from, you know, going in that design convergence and maybe trying to work even harder during that, those span of times in order to, um, get it done um it, ultimately i i mean that that that's what it is from our perspective i don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna change at all with the with the bag uh changes here obviously everything uh everything's going to retool no matter no matter what what we look at here it's gonna change a little bit for low resource teams mid resource teams high resource teams where the low resource teams uh are able to go visit practice fields easier now um, you know, the, the mid resource teams maybe don't necessarily have to build that practice pod. I know we haven't built a full, full practice pod almost ever. It's always been like 1.5 robots where you're using your 30 pounds to move your, uh, your business end of the robot from robot to robot. And, you know, just so you don't have to worry about those little minute details. So, you know, in, in some cases, unless you're, you know, worried about, that um you know last two weeks right before for for at least a uh, a domestic team the last two weeks right before champs where your your robots off and you need to practice during that time and you need a robot for it you know the, the uses of two robots start becoming less uh at, at least for one at our level um 
you, you know, I, I think uh, across the board, the bag's been pretty good at saving uh some of us are terrible at time management it's very good at saving us from ourselves um i'll i'll be very interested to hear what everyone else has to say i know i've you know i've gone back and forth on this one and it's uh i've probably leaned more toward uh against than for over the last two years like two years ago i was way more for getting rid of it now i'm you know a little more on the against side but i don't necessarily know how this is gonna land so it could end up you know great so we'll see all right, thanks, Ben. Well, one of yeah. the, we had a lot of comments in chat there talking about copying robots, and a lot of people are saying, "Oh, you know, no one would ever be able to copy a 254 type robot." But even with the withholding restrictions, Jim, in 2009, you guys did a pretty big rebuild uh, before Championship. Uh, before we even get to your opinions on the bag and stuff, do you want to talk about how effective what that rebuild consisted of and how effective it was? Yeah, I mean, 2009 was an interesting game uh, because of the, you know, the regolith and the smooth floor. So there were a lot of us, including your team, Karthik, that were pretty sure from initial testing that we needed to be able to aim because we wouldn't necessarily be able to maneuver. And then uh, in the early weeks, Wildstang came out and showed us all that we were wrong. And it wasn't just us. Like, we had built a turreting shooter. Uh, so had Lost Gorillas. So had Hots. So had Symbotics. So had many of us. Uh, we were wrong. The power dumper was the way to go. Um, believe it or not, Hot did the same thing. It's just no one ever saw their robot. Hot saw the Wildstang unveil in week one. They were playing in week three. They took their withholding allowance and they rebuilt the whole top of their robot uh, during the first out of bag and came in with a power dumper in the first one. We couldn't do it uh, because of the magnitude of the change, but we chose to do it for, for championship. And we brought in a 29 pound completely new upper apparatus and swapped it out at the championship. Um, and that was something that you could do. Now, being able to do that in your own shop without having to worry about the exact weight of the uh, – of the change would be something that I think more teams would entertain. It's uh, and I think overall that'll make things more competitive, but yes, yeah. we did that. Yep. Th thanks Jim. I just wanted to just kind of provide some perspective yep. out there. I think there's a lot of teams that totally will never be able to capable copy a 67 style robot and change it during the build season. But I do think that there are top teams who've already shown that they can do this and given these restrictions could. So I think it's easy to say, Oh, well, no one could copy a 254 robot, but, given enough time and resources, you know, don't underestimate what these teams can do. But that's an aside right now. So, Michael, um, I've been told that you have strong opinions on this, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Plot twist. I love it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um... Spoiler alert. Ah, uh, uh, uh... over, guys. Have a good night. All right, have a good night. No, I, listen, when they brought in the bag, I was heartbroken because I think the, the concept – okay, look, you're going to get a lot from – uh, actually not putting in a bag. You're going to get a lot more time, especially here in New York, where a lot of these teams, we're, we're week six. We're a lot later in the week. And there's a handful of uh, a good amount of teams that, that struggle like us with the, the New York City Board of Ed on our backs, uh, funding, all that stuff. It, it, it hurts a little bit. So getting the extra days will definitely help. But the big takeaway is the emotion that comes with putting the robot inside the crate, putting it inside the bag, and not being able to touch it. I think that is so critical. The emotions and the bonding that happen just from that alone, I, you can't, you're, you're getting rid of it. So I think it's going to affect a lot of teams because there's no real feeling of, of an end except the actual competition day. So for me, I, I think it's a big takeaway emotionally. You know, the old timers all know that you had the kids sign the crate, uh, painting the crate. There are some real, uh, really great, amazing looking crates just, just from an artist standpoint. But it, that's where it hurts. So even for us, what we did was we put the robot in a bag and then we dumped it in the crate that's in the hallway. So just so the kids didn't see it and I could still build off that emotion that the kids, well, now it's kind of out in the open because half of them are watching. But that, that's what I'm trying to build. I, I, and the alumni know that. Um, and I think it's just that's the most critical part that is being removed. I don't know how it's going to deeply react. I, hopefully it doesn't. Um, but there's a there's a bunch of benefits, um, like you said. If if now I don't have thirty more pounds to kind of swap out a part, now it gives teams that opportunity that yeah I'm at home, I'm in between regionals, I'm waiting to be off the wait list for Troy, so that's week two. So between two and six, hopefully you know nothing gets destroyed. But if I see something that that's sharper, that's is faster, or a mechanism that's better, 
why not try it in the shop and implement it on the robot? Nothing's to stop me. But that's good, right? I I don't know. I I, I don't I don't think so. I think I, I'm I'm an older mindset where here's what we drew. Uh, regardless if it, if it wins everything or it fails everything, this is what the kids came up with. This is what uh, the team came up with together. And here's the design, and we're going to give it a shot. So there's some tweaking. I, I get that, but I think the emotion is the big key, the big takeaway. Because if you have the resources to build these parts, great. Um, but those guys are going to do it anyway. You know, you're going to build those extra parts that are trying to get an advantage over everyone. That's, I mean, that's that's key. But I, for me, it's the emotion. It's you're taking away kids signing uh, the crate. You know, last year or uh, yeah, last year and the year before, kids were signing the robot over the powder coat, which hurt my soul. But they, you know, they just it's that it's that feeling of uh, you know love for the thing. It's being shipped off. It's in a bag. I can never touch it. Now I could drag it all the way to the competition and back and do whatever I want. So I I think it takes away from that. Yeah, I just um, before we I heard. I think that's a, a really like interesting perspective and I hadn't even thought of the emotional perspective. I just want to touch before we get to Jim on one really quick thing uh, to fun nation sitting in the chat, having this discussion. We love this discussion is happening. Uh, we are watching it. We are taking notes for our future discussion, especially for Karthik and I, how we kind of bring the rest of the conversation together, but please, please uh, have that conversation without taking someone else's opinion down. We are all allowed to think what we are thinking and have a response to this this news in our community it's a big deal uh all we can ask is uh you know keep your imagine your grandmother was reading chat we don't need to <laughs> call someone else's idea stupid or anything like that it's just we are allowed to share these opinions and we are making this a platform for the community so keep it chill over in the chat um i thank you for that michael i know that uh there's sort of this weird strange spot of like how do we how do we talk about this in a way that takes all of the different perspectives in account? So thank you very much for contributing. Uh, I guess we'll swing to the other side of said fence. And Tyler pointed out in chat that Ben is literally sitting in the middle of you because he's the guy on the fence. Yeah. Uh, so Jim, you have obviously years of of time rallying to pop the bag. So we would love to hear your thoughts on on the good of this, that the the plus side. So to, to basically frame a lot of this, you know, I joined first in 1998. Um, uh, my background prior to that is uh, various types of racing and motorsports with bicycles, motorcycles, cars. Um, I found this practice to be very strange when I joined first. In no other machine sport that I had ever seen would they take my machine away from me. Um, and then interestingly enough, in the robot sports that have evolved alongside or even after uh, FRC, even in the first family of programs, they do not take the robot away. So it is something that's kind of unique to FIRST. I think some people hang it on it is part of the uniqueness of FIRST, but I have never been convinced that's true. I've actually, from my observation, have been one of the people who have worked uh, you know, for more than 20 years to build the robotics community in Michigan, to create the district system and everything that we see. I have noticed from the very beginning in FIRST, there are the haves and there are the have-nots. And this is the one. This is one of the policies that very much benefits the haves. Uh, if you have the money and the resources and the engineering ability to build a second robot, you can work almost entirely around this constraint without interruption, uh, and and it is much to your competitive advantage. I'll come right out and say it. Deleting the bag is probably a disadvantage to my team in the long run. Why? Because it will allow other teams to more easily keep pace with us in the future. It is still a good thing because it is a good thing for the robotics community in general. We originally pitched this as part of the first in Michigan proposal 10 years ago in the summer of 2008. It was rejected by headquarters, but we were able for financial reasons to negotiate down to team delivered robots in sequestered bags from 
you know, freight shipping crates that cost, you know, seven or eight hundred dollars a piece to move around the state when everything became localized. We thought at the time that it would be a relatively short journey then to get rid of the bag once the ridiculousness of it kind of came out. But it took longer to do that when we thought because there are a lot of um, there are a lot of emotions around this topic and there are a lot of people who very much want a break from the development. My take on it is, as I outlined in my paper, is there's a lot of teams who are not successful in FRC. Um, FRC is hard. Even if you've done it before, it's hard. It's very difficult. Uh, I understand the nature of the desire to put um, realistic deadlines on people to teach kids the lessons of planning and deadlines. But a lot of people, as you say, do not have good program management skills on an after-school club. They don't. Uh, and one of the problems you have with bag day is it causes kind of an unrecoverable event at the end of your season. And we see this over and over and over again with a lot of new teams and a lot of weaker teams that they will have a bad uh, initial season. And then they exit F FRC often to never return. Uh, if we want the sport to grow, uh, giving people a recovery uh, window is very important to keep them in the league. It's one of the important things because if you build a robot that doesn't work and then you're given the opportunity to work on it to make it work, that can still be a very gratifying experience and we want that to be available to everybody. So, I mean, on the, you know, on the downs, on the upside and mixed downside, will it reduce cost and frustration for teams? Uh, it depends. I think in some, in some cases it may drive additional costs. Uh, in, some, in many cases that I know, it will save costs. There are many teams who openly say, we will not build a second robot, and we spend thousands of dollars a year doing so, uh, and the only reason we do it is because of the bag. Um, will it make the robots better? One of the things I have with FRC is I still think as a sports spectacle, it's lacking until we get to the very end. Uh, this will on net make all of the robots better because it will give everybody more opportunity to build a more capable machine. Um, will it make some people work more? Yes, it will. Um, uh, will it make some people work less? Yes, it will. A lot of people build a second robot, do all sorts of things to prepare for these changeovers, withholdings, uh, transition of parts, porting over of your calibrations, all of this work that no longer may need to be done if you choose not to do it. Um, will it give more exposure? This is actually, I think, one of the number one reasons why I've always been against the bag. Um, the number one time when you want to promote anything, when you have a pep rally at your school for the football team or something, it's right before the big game. It's right before you go to compete. Talking about your robot weeks or months before you go to compete doesn't really build any hype or build anybody to want to come and experience the event. And one thing about FIRST, it's very experiential. People do not understand what it is until they go to a tournament and see the excitement. If you could take your robot into a pep rally or into a, a promotional event with your student body at your school, shortly or immediately before your event to try to get people to come on your fan bus and come out to your district or regional. I think that would be very, very powerful. I think if I can take my comp robot, my fully graphic comp robot to my suppliers facilities, to my, to my sponsors facilities during the competition season, it would make it that much easier to get them to come to the venue to get them to increase their support for FRC. I think we've been doing ourselves a grave disservice by sequestering all these fantastic inventions during the critical time when promotion is the most valuable to us. And I think that's the thing where we're gonna benefit the most. And then will it make FRC more fair overall? Yes, I believe fundamentally it will. Will it create some arms races of iteration through the season? Yes, but I think most of the teams still are going to have a set amount of hours that they're willing to commit every every week, um, and that probably is not going to fundamentally change for most for most teams. The number of weeks they work over may change, but I'll actually say it for myself: is I may now actually have. Um, uh, an environment in which I don't have to work six or seven days a week for six weeks continuously. I might actually be able to option out some of the time during what traditionally has been the build season uh, and move it into later weeks in the calendar. I think but overall, that's, it's that's going what to I don't make everything do. better. Sorry, well, Michael, again, Michael, yeah, go on. Go no, ahead, that's, Mike. What I, that's what I don't want to do. I, I don't want to extend my season. I, I'm going to file divorce papers at the end of this, and I'm going to give Frank Merrick the bill. 
it, it just is, well, you know. Well, but, it, it, but you are, so you say by yourself, you're, you're competing late in the season. You're competing in week six, right? You So I don't know. Yeah, I got, exactly. I got, I got, I got, right. I, uh, as of now, I'm on the wait list for week two. And then New York is usually later. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it's so gonna, it's okay. how many hours you need to put in to build a robot. Not that you need to put in that many hours in every week. One of the issues that I have is it, it's very difficult. Um, I have it, like I said, I, the, I have the job that I have professionally because it does not require me to travel in the first three months of the year. I would yeah. not take a job that was a promotion because of FRC. I literally have changed my schedule where I work overnight. So I'm reporting to work at 10 p.m. at night and I was fortunate enough to do the switch with another guy. So I work overnight, so I'm out at six, seven in the morning. Uh, if I mm-hmm. take a double, big deal, I'm out at two o'clock. And then the school does the after hours from three on. So I've, I've made that sacrifice. I can't, I can't continue having, six weeks is fine. You know, I, I can manage the six weeks. Uh, the thing that kills me is once in a while we get a school closure for uh, snow. So yeah. great, it, it, benefit, it benefits a bunch of uh, Northern teams. I get it, that's fine. But, uh, but guys like myself where we can kind of predict, oh, you know, school's gonna be closed on Friday guess what? We're, we're not going to work or we're going to leave ourselves just enough work to, to kind of pretend that that snow day had never happened. And our stop build day for ourselves is roughly week four ish so that I can work out the kinks. There's something. Yeah. I, it's a point of no return. So now I've changed my point of no return. I hope my shipping can, you know, if I order new parts, I'm burnt out. The there's nothing that out. stops you from maintaining the point of no return exactly where it is. Now you have flexibility. If you look at the VEX program, like I like using VEX as a great counter example. Okay. VEX, VEX, you have an entire year. The kickoff and the world championship are the same event. You have an entire year. You don't have one semester. You have an entire year end to end. The reality of VEX is everybody gets the game and probably 70, 80% of the teams that I work don't work with, don't do anything for several months. They just make drawings make CAD models they don't build anything some teams throw down and start building right away uh because they want to but they don't have to this gives us more flexibility on when we have to do things which I think is great well I don't like because now now I'm going to wait for everybody to come up with their designs hopefully I get a spy photo or two maybe a robot in three days is the answer and now I could just sit back wait and now like you said it's a bunch of copycats and that's that's I, but, rough. That's what we try to avoid. And, and, and I think the, the Vex example, Jim. Um, it, yes, I agree. There's a lot of teams that don't. But I mean, I'll I'll, I'll give the eleven fourteen perspective on this because as the Vex program has grown, eleven fourteen used to dominate Vex. Yeah. To the point where their robots would go entire seasons without losing matches, and they were just like dummy teams. It was like high comedy at these events. And then it came to a certain point where, but, but like eleven fourteen was very much work on Vex in the fall stop during the frc season take the robots to championship yep and that became impossible at a certain point or to the point 11 14 didn't even qualify for vex world last year because working that for the 2020 season the top we will be teams that top five percent was working constantly and it's hard to if you're in a competitive region or if even if you're not in a competitive region it's hard to succeed at vex world now unless you are working at those sorts of levels so i'm not necessarily saying and i have i'll get to a lot here i just wanted to interject since we were talking about facts i think this the amount of work will shift over time because our top teams aren't hitting the point where they are feeling limited so they're going to continue working and continue working and the the scale slowly slowly i I think the point card thing is it's not necessarily about the top teams. That tends to be the focus of the discussion because those tend to be a lot of the parties that get brought in on this. But it really is about a lot of the teams who aren't necessarily represented on this show. Absolutely. I I just wanted to point that the shift that can happen. We have 550 teams just in Michigan, you know. So just in Michigan, we now have more teams than we had in in the entire FRC in like 2002 or so. So, and many of those teams, you know, they struggle to get resources. They're in outlying areas, et cetera, et cetera. I think that this just makes it a lot easier for them to get in and compete 
and everything else. If we're talking about winning the world championship, only a very small number of teams win the world championship. Most teams, it's not their destiny to win the world championship. It's nice that they can try, but what we're really trying to do is get them a gratifying competition experience uh, for essentially the least, uh, you know, the least uh, amount of investment possible. Like what is it costing them in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of effort? You know, um, one of the things you have with first is it's very hard to, I actually find first is very difficult to teach through regards, despite the fact that it's supposed to be educational because the pace of it is so hectic once you actually get the game design that you basically have to go into execution mode if you want to execute at a very high level. I actually think that this change opens the door a little bit to have your robot be, build be a little more casual so that you can do more education dur during the actual build process. We all work with high school kids. We, yep. are, we, we know that they're <laughs> going to be lazy to begin with. There's a whole chunk of them. Well, that's the other beauty of having two robots. We, we've done uh, practice robots the last... Uh, four years since I, I joined 333. So it, it, it helps dramatically. There's a big group of kids. They Every kid that walks through the door wants to put their hands on the robot. So here you go. Here's two of them. So that sure. that, that helps out in, in that aspect. Um, but I don't know. It's rough. I Listen, there's going to be a bunch of people that hate me. I probably won't even get picked now. Let alone people no, that I don't think so. I was. People no, don't that, remember who I was now. I'm a peasant. I'm a but peasant this, in the first community. <laughs> this, is, this is a divisive issue, which is why I think it's taken a long time to resolve. Um, and again, I praise the wisdom of Frank and everybody uh, involved in this in taking the time to study the problem, make an informed, data-driven decision, and finally come to this. Is it the end of the story? Probably not. Um, I actually don't think that this is the biggest change in the history of FRC. I think it's a change. It's a big change. I think for a lot of teams, it's not fundamentally going to make that much difference. Um, so, so let me ask, how about for, for this year, I don't put it in the bag? What if we do that? Well, really no... that's against the rules, so you'd be breaking the rules. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, right now, uh, it, it's a simple plastic tag. Nobody yeah. knows. Nobody calls my cell phone number on the form. Well, that's the whole point, isn't it, no. Mike? I mean, it's been on the honor system for 10 years since we've instanced the bag. We have no idea how many teams are, are lying on that or not. Everything in the and FRC that's why is basically I want on the, the honor system. That's why I want the crate back. You ship it away, no one can touch it. Well, but then it costs hundreds of dollars of teams to insure uh, per right. team You're to right. insure that. So that's a huge financial cost when you start talking a league of thousands of teams. The the I whole know. point on that is, in our case, we literally would have it where the drayage facility is further from our build site than <laughs> the, than the district event. Right. So we would we would ship them away only to have them returned from whence they came on you know ups's dollar so it seemed kind of ridiculous uh when we started scaling that right you're not wrong it's it's, so it's good yeah but i i think right to me one of the biggest change you know one of the biggest changes first ever made actually was alliances you know it just appeared in 99 and all of a sudden instead of playing for yourself you're always playing with somebody else you're always playing with multiples we have teams of robots instead of individual effort and it fundamentally changed the culture of frc i still think in the history of first that was a much more profound change than this will ever be this is just an operational detail really that essentially changed the fundamental culture of first and i think what's so interesting is when we talk about things like alliances or other large changes in the community we, we look back at them with such a different perspective on the discussion that was had. So I'm very curious when some of you guys in the chat that are, you know, going to be alumni one day and come over and host whatever first podcast is up at the time, uh, what you'll say about the discussion we had. I think that's going to be really interesting. So um, <laughs> we've let you guys have it out. Uh, I think Karthik and I have some thoughts to share as well. Um, and I, I really appreciate, by the way, the active and uh, polite discussion. I think it's really nice to be able to share that. So thank you guys. Thank you, chat as well for listening to that. Um, I actually want to start with a, I had a whole, you know, plan, some notes, but I've actually added some stuff based on our chat discussion. Uh, Struck by the Bell in chat posted a really key quote uh, that I want to touch onto. Not having bag forces some teams to, to face an uncomfortable truth. They're not all that good at time management and probably need to work on it. So I'm kind of in the same place as you, Mike. Uh, 
or I'm in a little bit of a weird place. This doesn't change a lot for us in terms of how we build. 1923 is a huge team. We've got over 100 students. We're always going to build two robots because it's the way that I have enough stuff for kids to do. Yep. Um, it's going to be useful for us. Like we've already, our mentors have already sort of talked about this um, in terms of whether like those two robots are going to be like a programming bot. Are they still going to be twins? How are they going to match up? Whatever it is, we still have a lot of stuff to build. So it's not something, I, I think it kind of falls into what you're saying, Jim, of like, this is not a huge gain for a team like mine. We're still going to do basically what we did. Um, but I love that we can continue to iterate and there's not this sort of false wall between us and one of the robots that we're building. Um, and actually, a lot of the comparisons in chat are about FTC and how FTC works currently, because they do get a kickoff in September and then events in November, December, January, March, April. Um, it's it's also a similar length of time. Um, and again, we're in a weird spot because we treat our FTC teams like many FRC teams. Um, we make a choice that the deadline on what they're doing and the priorities they choose need to be done in advance of their event. We don't lock up their robots because I'm not a monster, right? I don't get like a gallon Ziploc bag and just put it over the top, but now I kind of want to. Uh, <laughs> it, we, we talk about project planning and project management in a way that even though they do have this open build season, like, hey, you've made, you know, these six or seven choices of robot attributes that you want. You're not going to get them all done before your first event in November. So pick four, make a priority list, get the robot to that point, compete, see what you love, see what you hate, and then iterate. And obviously you have to see a little bit different because this might affect teams where there's only one regional, right? It, it's a little bit of a different comparison. It's not one-to-one, -one, but we talk about having to lock functionality behind a further iteration and saying like, we have to choose what we're going to do now. There's a, a, you know, some sort of a fake deadline that is not a first enforced one. And then they have to learn from their competition. Um, so I think what's really cool here is that first is making it the team's choices. Um, on the side of like work expense to fill the time allotted, uh, like I said, over hundred students, five technical mentors. So I also worry about burnout super hard. Um, but I like that first is putting that goal setting and that deadline in the hands of teams. Um, and the example I wanted to use is actually something that happened to me at work today, um, is that in a lot of cases you get the deadline from your boss, right? Like you get this, like you have to do this project and it's due like January 1st, whatever. It's a nice round number for right now. But at the same time, you have to figure out what the smaller milestones are within that process. So right, the whole project has to be done at a certain time. But as a team, as my project team at this big company, I have to pick between now and then what I get done and what deadlines. Um, actually, uh, Tyler wrote January 1 with a question mark in our chat. Actually, my deadline's tomorrow morning, so this could be fun. Um, but <laughs> in between as a team, we have to choose what we're doing like week one, week two. And we do that in build season already, most, most teams or teams that think about the problem beforehand, right? Um, I think that it's really nice that first is kind of shifting the the responsibility for that schedule setting into teams instead of making a fake deadline for the sake of we've always done it that way. Jim's made this point really, really well and really eloquently, and I'm not going to be able to quite as well as he can, but I really want to touch back on the Frank quote that uh, Karthik read at the beginning, which is that we are striving to provide equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. The effect, the biggest effect this is going to have on teams is teams who right now, last season, this season, next season for 2019 are going to feel at a disadvantage because they can't afford to, or don't have the resources, the people time to build that second robot. Because right now, if you're not keeping like there, a lot of the comments in chat are like, oh, well now it's 12 weeks instead of six weeks. It's always been that way. Six weeks as we've discussed this on the show before is sort of this weird myth. You're still working. You're still iterating throughout the time between bag day and your regional, whether you're physically working on something or you're thinking about the problem. And so I think what's really going to impact the teams in a positive way, as Jim was kind of putting out, was teams who are right now behind the eight ball because they don't have the ability to continue iterating after stop build day um, are going to have a really, really nice advantage here that like it feeds to that Frank quote of a quality of opportunity. You're not going to get to your competition and feel like super set back 
and I, what I'm hoping for is that it takes away some of the resentment of like, oh, that team has so much money, they can build another robot, right? Like, I'm hoping that leaves our community because we all have this, there's, I mean, we've still all had six weeks, but now it's like your deadline of when the thing has to be done is still your event, but you can choose your deadlines in the middle. Um, my TLDR is I love, 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 love that no matter what a team's resource level or experience is, the team has independence over their project schedule leading up to an event because we teach our students all of these wonderful technical skills, all of these awesome soft skills, but this is a new way of within a team's structure being able to teach project management. And I really like that, but I have uh, talked way too much. So I'm going to let Pat take it away because I know he's got some thoughts too. Thanks, thanks Libby. Um, I think for the first time in Canada speaking history, this is the first time where I may very much disagree with a lot of what you just said. Um, I think that down, so, folks. <laughs> got it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, first off, um, I think I, I like to, to think of things in terms of buckets and how this these changes are going to impact different subsets of teams. And because I really don't, I still don't know how I feel about this change. Um, I know it's going to benefit the teams that I've been involved with, but I think that's kind of irrelevant to the system because I kind of care more what's going to happen to first as a whole. But if you take the teams and say, let's look at teams who currently work past six weeks and teams who don't. Well, teams in the bucket of teams who currently work past six weeks, this is obviously going to benefit them in terms of their robot because they now have more access so they can do more stuff in their continued work. Now let's look at those teams who don't work past six weeks. I think you can put them into two buckets. I think there's some, the teams who don't work past six weeks because they don't have access to their robot and don't have the resources to do anything crazy with the withholding allowance. And you have teams who just right now don't want to work past six weeks. And I think the teams that are now getting access to a robot from that bucket, they're going to be happy about this too, because they can continue working and they've always wanted to. And so they're good. But now you have this group of teams content with the six weeks and now has more time. And what happens to them? And I do think that this is probably a small grouping of teams, but I think that their opinions are really important. The other thing I want to talk about is hidden costs. Um, there's a lot of teams out there who are very good at managing their time and build great robots year after year after year. But there's often hidden costs associated with that. And there are teams who are experiencing great degrees of burnout already. And there are multiple... I, Every year in this program, this is where I get concerned, I see students who end up not getting into the universities of choice that they wanted to because their grades have dropped so much because of FRC. And this concerns me. And I know that Libby said, well, you know, it's great for teams to set their project management and this to figure stuff out. But like, sometimes things are important enough that limits need to be established. And a lot of people are like, well, there's no other re place where they would enforce limits like this. And that's not even close to true. The NCAA, which is one of the biggest sporting organizations in the entire world for college athletics, they about 10 years ago realized we're a program for student athletes, but our athletes are spending way too much time on sports and they are hurting their academic careers and they are hurting their lives. And they came up with serious practice restrictions. And I'm not necessarily saying that sports should do this, but I just want to point out the example there that in the NCAA right now they have countable hours that teams athletes cannot be spending more than 20 hours on their sports and it's like now there's all sorts of enforcement issues we know about that in the NCAA but sometimes limits are needed when things like safety and student well-being matters and I'm not saying that because going getting rid of the bag might actually help with student well-being if teams are able to manage their time properly. But this is where I get really, really concerned. When you leave things to teams, and the NCAA saw this, when they left things to teams, it, it, crazy stuff started happening, and people were being overworked. High school athletics often have, have these sorts of things too. And so at least the six weeks for some teams provided a concrete start and stop. But we know it didn't for most teams. Well, I shouldn't say for most teams, for a lot of other teams. But to say that, oh, there's some teams who are good at managing their time, there's fine. Like, the burnout stories are real. Now, any sort of time limits that FRC could ever uh, impose 
would absolutely lower the quality of the roads. And it's just whether that's a trade-off or not. The NFL, the NF, the NFF being L has put in limits on the amount of times teams can practice. You have only a certain amount of practices you can put in for an entire season. And that has totally hurt the quality of play in the NFL. It absolutely has. If you look at offensive line play, because they teams just haven't been able to practice enough. But that, that one was done for issues, not necessarily about burnout, but for player safety, because, and, you know, football, r- repeated head injuries and that sort of thing. Jim brought up something that was really interesting to me when he said it's important for teams to have a recovery window. And I'm kind of thinking that maybe, yes, let's go unlimited. You have access to your robot whenever. But is there a way to throw in a recovery period to enforce a tools down for a certain amount of time? I don't know. Um, again, it would all be on our system. If you think back to what we had with the fix-it windows years ago, teams only had so much time that they were allowed to work on their um, spare parts and stuff each week. Teams violently, flagrantly cheated. It was annoying, but I don't really, you know, I just, I'm just saying that I'm not necessarily really even talking about pro-bag or anti-bag anymore. But I think that we cannot ignore the burnout issues, especially and when it comes to students, because as adults in this program, we are responsible for the well-being and the safety of these students. And I think that there are some teams who do a good job with this and are very easy to say, like, hey, now is a designated homework time or looking at one kid. You've been here too much. You need to go home. But I've also seen a lot of FRC teams who have broken students because the mentors, adults, and other students on the team are so concerned about winning that they will work those students to death. And it's terrifying at times. And also, how many times have we all heard this whole statement about, you know, first is like a family. My team is my family. We hear that all the time. But one of the things when you have those sorts of environments is you never want to let your family down. So if you're that linchpin programmer and You don't want to set your own limits because you'd rather suffer on your own and take the pain of burning out if it meant that your team's automotive was going to work because the team was counting on you. And I want limits to help protect that student somehow. So I've kind of drifted on the bag topic or whatever here, but I, I do think this stuff is important. Overall, if it was up to me, I would have probably left the bag in, but actually gotten rid of the withholding allowances. And just kind of said, this is, we're ter- changing this to a six week program. I understand it's going to hurt robot quality, but I think our robot quality is at a place right now where I'm pretty, I think we're at the point right now where these robots belong on TV, uh, at least the, the top echelon of it. And I think that, I, I, I don't know, I just think uh, removing the bags is going to do a lot of cool things and it's going to give teams a lot more access. And I think it gives teams the opportunities to make this program less encompassing. But man, I think we as a community need to find ways to ensure that we're doing things the right ways and teams are managing the products, projects well. A few years ago, a lot of the top teams started coming out and talking about how they've started working less. Um, the Citrus Circuits were one of the big ones to start promoting that. And I think that's been really important because other teams, for a while, there was this stupid arms race for people to be like, oh, well, I practiced for 200 hours. I practiced for 250 hours. And it was crazy. It's like, no, you're like high school kids. Like, you shouldn't be doing this. Like, wait, what are we all doing there? So, I mean, that's kind of my rant, all that. But I think, Jim, I think you hit on something with the recovery window. There's actually a really interesting, uh, and Tyler, sorry for the word use, because it's going to get the YouTube archive demonetized, but it's a really interesting article one of my coworkers sent me, hilariously, about uh, the phrase, uh, and I'm sorry, again, for word use, but it's hustle porn, right? Like this idea of people being like, I'm so busy, I'm working all the time. This is like, and I do this, I'm so guilty of this, right? But like, there is this idea that I like, just to, to touch on what you're saying, I really like the idea of as a community deciding that we can't be okay with that kind of like burnout accepted culture, right? Like when, when Citrus Circuits and I think the Poof said something about like, oh, we're working fewer days this week. It's, it's a really nice permission slip for teams that are trying and burning themselves out to keep up with that to like, oh, well, maybe there's some merit to the idea that I can work less often and be more productive. And I think you're, you said you started that off by saying we were going to disagree and actually totally agree with what you're saying. Like 
we need to set limits. What I, my, what I love is that it's kind of in from a project management perspective, letting teams set their own mini milestones from a team, a community, a student well-being perspective. I 1000 million zillion percent agree with you as a first community. We need to be better about talking about the fact that our students should be students first and robotics kids second, right? They have, well, I mean, they, my, like a lot of teams is like family is more important than school, than robots, right? Whatever you choose, make sure that your, your well being, your personal health is, is, uh, up high there. And I think that's something as a first community, we need to make sure we're taking a handle on because now there's no official deadline. And so we have to really think about that, especially as mentors too. We are um, approaching the end of the show, but I do want to get some final thoughts on this topic from our guests. So starting with Jim. Um, I think that this will be a big improvement and it will cause the lower and middle class of FRC to get a better overall first competition experience. I think it does come at the risk of overwork to the teams who are really driven to be top competitors. All right, Michael. Frank said it's the quality outcome. That's the big picture here, right? First, also taglines, it's more than just robots. You guys cannot argue that, you know, that this is a family. It, it, it is. It's, you know, you get, you get really emotional. You know, when I first joined here, the kids threw a birthday party for me. I, I had to go hide in the corner and cry. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe these guys did this. So things like, yeah, you are a family. And it is more than just robots as cheesy or, or it's real. It, it is more than just robots. And the bag kind of takes that away. So I don't know how to recover from that point. And for me, because of that feeling with the kids, that, that means more to me than anything. And I don't know how I could figure out a way to make that work. And everything you said, that there are a ton of benefits. So, But that, to me, is the big one. And that kind of brings everyone together. And uh, I don't know. We'll, I guess we'll just see. All right, Ben. On the surface, I would say more access is good. It opens up things in the way that uh, just kind of like, you know, capitalism say, you know, it, it, it opens it up so that you can kind of, that teams can have the ability to do more what they want in a variety of different ways. Um, it, it opens the doors that way. Obviously the downside, um, we may have to have a new solution to save us from ourselves. It will either developed by ourselves or um, someone will put it on us on one side. So, hey, I don't know what's going to happen, but, um, you know, we'll see. I'm still in the fence. Hey, Ben, if we um, made you director of FRC for a day, you had to either choose to um, get rid of the bag or keep the bag, nothing in between. What's your choice? Yeah, probably... Um, right, right now, probably get rid of, but only barely. Yeah. I, I, unlike you, I would always keep the withholding <laughs> allowance because uh, I, I do have to say that because, um, if you don't have that, it gives you no insurance whatsoever. Oh, I'm moving. Wow. We've moved you over to your side of the fence. Go over there. Yeah, um, the, the, the withholding allowance you know, gives you total insurance in case you totally mess up your strategic direction of your robot to even make something out of your season. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm on the, the camp on that point. But, um, yeah, I, I uh, you, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.